Hello, welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show, where we'll be discussing leadership, business, and human potential, inspiring you to live rich from the inside out, unlock your creativity, stretch out of your comfort zone, break through your barriers, take inspired action, and achieve epic results. Now, here's your host, two-time best-selling author, speaker, and certified executive coach, Deborah Kosowski. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Millionaire Woman Show. We're going to be talking about leadership, business, and human potential. And I have a special guest that I have known for a number of years, and uh, I love her to pieces. She's doing some amazing things in the world, both in fiction and nonfiction. Um, Gail Z. Martin is an expert marketer, international speaker, best-selling author, specializing in social media marketing. Lifehack named her previous book, 30 Days to Social Media Success, as one of the top 20 business books to read in 2016. And if you haven't read it, make it your 2017. Her new book, The Central Social Media Marketing Handbook, a new roadmap to maximizing your brand influence and credibility is her latest, latest books. Congratulations, Gail. Welcome to our show. I had to do my little Vanna White there with it. I couldn't resist. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to see you again. Yeah, it's, it's so great to see you and you've been doing some great things. And, you know, as I was looking through some of the things that you're doing, one of the biggest things that stands out is, you know, we talk about social media and people are using the same patterns. And I'm really curious, like, you know, last year's social media tactics aren't working anymore. What do you think people can start doing about that? Um, well, the biggest thing to understand is that all of the sites, but especially Facebook, have algorithms, mathematical equations behind the scenes that figure out what to serve up to you. Before Facebook had half the planet as members, if you signed on to like somebody's profile or their business page, you got to see everything they posted. Well, with three billion some people, that doesn't work anymore. So Facebook takes it upon itself to figure out what you might be interested in based on how many other people are interested in that thing. So you're only getting to see a fraction of what actually gets posted. And the fancy term for that is organic reach. That means it's not paid for. Well, the problem is their idea of what you're interested in and what you really are interested in might be very different. And so when people don't realize that that algorithm changes every so often and reprioritizes what it shows you, that's where the, the tactics get out of sync with the results. Because on the old algorithm, what you were doing might have worked just fine. And then they switch things up a bit and say, no, 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 we think more people are interested in X, Y, Z than ABC. And now all of a sudden you're going, where'd all my traffic go? How come I'm not getting comments anymore? That's largely what's behind it. Wow. What kind of changes have some of the big sites like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn made? And why should business people and marketers care? Well, one of the biggest and most disturbing changes on Facebook is the way Facebook has treated the business pages. And they were originally called fan pages, but they're those pages that aren't your personal profile, that you set up with the intention of attracting people who want to know more about your business. Now, when Facebook set it up originally, the idea was you encouraged people to come like your page, and then they would get to see all of your business-related news, and that would get those, that, that kind of information off the personal profile so that they would just be personal. Well, that worked for a while, and a lot of us took out Facebook ads and spent money encouraging people to come over to like our page, and then Facebook got kind of greedy, and they said, well, you know, we're not going to show everybody who likes a page every post. That would be organic reach. We're going to bring out boosted posts. And, you know, of course, a boosted post encourages you to throw five, 10, 50 bucks at it for more people to see it. The thing is, they're not just trying to get you to pay those boosted posts to show it to people outside of the group that's liked your page. They're kind of holding your own audience hostage and saying, 
it's nice that you've spent all that money and effort to get people to like your page. But now if you actually want them to see anything you're posting, give us another 30 bucks, give us another 100 bucks. And the organic reach now, that, that unpaid reach on your business page is down to about 1% to 3%. Think about that. All those people you attracted to that page, all the ads you ran, all the money you spent, all the, the marketing you did, 1% to 3% are getting to see something just because you posted it, unless you come up with some more cash. That's shocking. That is disgusting. But that's where Facebook is, is now making its money. And the other dirty trick here is that when you boost a post the first time, it works really well. And you go, okay, I don't like it, but I can throw some money at this. Second time, that same amount of money doesn't get you quite as much. Third time, same amount of money doesn't get you quite as much either. It's kind of like that first hit from the schoolyard drug dealer, and then everything else costs more. Um, so it really is a bit of a racket. Now, there are a couple ways around this. One is... Um, for, for the time being, at least, creating a Facebook group allows you to send notifications to everybody in the group. So if you can create a Facebook group and attract the people who liked your pages, or at least your most active interactors on your pages, to come join yet another thing on Facebook, a group, at least so far, they haven't capped notifying group members. So at least that means everybody in the group gets, a, gets the message for now, until they change mm -hmm. things. Um, and you can do that by splitting off topics too. So it's not like, hey, you guys liked my page, now come over and like my group. That gets hard. But if you make it, I'm doing a subgroup to talk about this special niche thing, that makes it a little easier to attract people over. The other thing that this has really shown us is the importance of, of our email newsletters. You know, if Facebook went away tomorrow, we'd have no way of getting in touch with most of those people who have liked our page because we don't have any contact information for them. If, you know, with, with your email newsletter, as old school as that seems, you know, and it doesn't seem as, as fresh and sexy as social media, but as old school as that seems, you own those names. They've given you opt-in permission. They are yours until they opt out. And even if your email provider goes away, that list is still yours. So we've actually started to see a resurgence of people going back and prioritizing doing um, email newsletters again. I'm not saying get off of Facebook. Facebook matters. But you have to understand the game is rigged and not rely on it as, you know, a godsend because it, it, it isn't. It's a crooked game. It's very, very interesting because I was like, oh, because, you know, people are going away from newsletters. I've, I was finding that because they're like, just find me on Facebook. Just find me on Instagram. And it is really cool to know that it's still there because I still use mm -hmm. an email newsletter. Um, but I find that people don't often sign up as much because of the clutter of it, because when they're in Facebook and Instagram and things, it's more controlled. They get to control how much they see, how much they receive, right? Because I know well, people might not, not even comment now because they know that they're going to get all these notification of people's comments unless they change their settings, right? Well, and, and you know, that, that brings up another point because Facebook's algorithms tend to prioritize what it sees as popular. And the more likes and shares and comments you get, then Facebook's al algorithm goes, ooh, this is important. Let's show it to more people. Mm -hmm. So if people have a disincentive to comment or like because they don't want to go in and adjust their notices, now you've got kind of warring rewards. Facebook isn't going to show you as much if you aren't what it considers active by liking and sharing and commenting. And the posts you're probably interested in won't get to as many people if people don't interact with them. They're kind of trying to force the social piece of social media, whether you want to be social or right. not. So for companies who haven't been on social media yet or organizations, because I know that there's still that are some that are leery of jumping, jumping in, even though social media has been around for a while, what would you recommend to them? 
Um, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter are still the big three. And that's where everybody is. So, you know, like it or not, if that's where the crowd is and you want to reach the crowd, you do need to have a presence there. And if you don't, you're really conspicuous by your absence and your competitor's probably there and you aren't. You just have to understand the uses, the specialties and the limitations of the different platforms. Facebook's like a big party. When you go to a party, you know you're not gonna have a conversation with everybody in the room, but you mill around and you, you have some nice conversations. Twitter is more like a cocktail party where you really aren't gonna get in an in-depth conversation with anybody, but you're going to float around and, and trade a little bit of chit chat with a lot of people. LinkedIn is the business network coffee or luncheon. That's where you're really going to make a strong business connection and share really important information. So it can kind of form a, a funnel for you where Twitter's the more casual interaction, Facebook gives you a little more and then, then people who are really into you get, get connected on LinkedIn. Um, and you also have to understand it, it's not that much different than when we were using billboards and radio ads and print ads. They didn't each do the same things. They weren't all good at the same things. They didn't reach each audience equally. So you just have to know what they do and what they don't do and where the limitations and strengths are and play to those. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about LinkedIn for a minute. Okay. So in, you know, we have networking online, networking in person. When you are networking on LinkedIn, what would you say would be maybe three etiquette things that people need to keep in mind because it's a different platform than the other ones? Very different. Um, well, one thing is that on LinkedIn, meeting strangers is not as easy as on Facebook or Twitter. Facebook and Twitter really uh, are very open to having you like or friend or follow somebody you don't know. They encourage that. That's how you get to know people. LinkedIn can actually penalize you if you start going out there and sending a whole lot of invitations to people who say, I don't know you, go away. So you want these to be at least warm connections. And that's one of the wonderful things about LinkedIn showing you who your connections are connected to. So instead of going cold to somebody that you'd like to meet, go look and see if anybody you already know fairly well knows that person and ask if they would be willing to do an introduction for you. Now, I'm not going up to a total stranger and saying, hi, I'm a really nice person and I'm good at what I do. We should, we should talk to each other. I'm going and saying, Deborah told me wonderful things about you. Uh, could we talk? And they're gonna say, well, yes, I know Deborah. I trust Deborah. Sure, we can, we can connect. Um, and that's also why you want to be a little choosy about who you agree to connect with on LinkedIn, because when someone asks that of you, um, you want to know them well enough to feel comfortable making that connection uh, or, have, or being able to ask them to make that connection. So you can't just walk in and friend everybody. Um, Facebook and Twitter, you can post on much more frequently than LinkedIn. Facebook, once or, once or twice a day. Um, Twitter you know, once an hour at least. Um, LinkedIn, no more than once a day, maybe once every couple of days. Um, video is really the new 800 pound gorilla on social media. In fact, Facebook prioritizes video content. You're, it will show your video to more people just because it's video than it will show a, a text post or a post with a photo. But, um, Facebook sees YouTube as a competitor. So it suppresses a YouTube video. Hmm. It will show Facebook Live and it will show if you take a, a video with your cell phone camera and then upload from there to YouTube, uh, to Facebook directly, then it will prioritize it. In fact, experts say, and several people like Eleanor Stutz and Vivica Von Rosen that I interviewed in the Essential Social Media Marketing book, I say that they expect the content on social media in the future to be primarily video. It's really going that direction. Um, those don't all have to be glossy produced things. They can be a 20 second 
thought that you share, but it's going the video way, coming back to LinkedIn. LinkedIn still doesn't have its arms around video the way that Facebook and Twitter do. It's still a little kludgy. And when I talked to those LinkedIn experts in the book, they admitted that and they said, LinkedIn's a little slow to the party here. It will let you share a YouTube link, but it's not as seamless as Facebook and Twitter have made it. I expect it's going to change in the future. I expect that they're going to um, fix that, but it's not quite there yet. So yes, do what you need to do with your videos to get them priorities prioritized on YouTube. What I suggest is take the video on your cell phone camera, upload it directly to Facebook, and then upload it to YouTube where you can caption it so people can tell what you're talking about without having um, the volume turned up and use that YouTube link elsewhere because YouTube is a powerful force on its own. And that in, in combination with Facebook Lives, right? Because Facebook, Facebook Lives Facebook. are really popular right now and they have a lot of power. Facebook Lives are very powerful. Facebook prioritizes that content, shows it to more people organically. Um, Facebook's really pushing you that way. Uh, but if you... If you want to do it twice, do it on Facebook Live and then do it again on your phone so that you can send it to YouTube. Uh, but there is value in having it both ways because YouTube is still a formidable presence and a lot of people use YouTube mm -hmm. uh, to find content because YouTube has its own powerful search engine. You can't really go looking for content easily on Facebook by searching for it. It's hit or miss. YouTube has a much better way to pull up exactly what you're looking for, whether it's a recipe or how to, you know, fix your dog. <laughs> Are you finding that Thank each you. of the platforms is now all using hashtags? Like even Facebook, people are yeah. using hashtags as well? Hashtags have become pretty much universal. Hashtags and the at sign. So, you know, on Twitter, our, our handles, our names have that at sign in front of it. Um, what I'm finding, what we've seen on Facebook is that can um, help make your tagging easier if you use the, the at sign and someone's name. It's more likely to pull up the person's name. But hashtags, um, I think it's Facebook's a little cumbersome way of trying to make it a little easier to find trending topics like on, on Twitter. And of course, on Twitter, hashtags really make it easier for people to find you by topic. Wow. How, so how can business owners and marketers keep up with there's ever shifting changes? Like, and why does it matter so much that they do? It matters because that's where the conversation is. You know, if you found out that there were three really hot business networking groups in town, you'd want to go join those groups and show up to the meetings and, and let people like know and trust you because you're there consistently and they get in conversations with you. Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are exactly like that. That's where the conversation is happening. Only it's even more powerful than a meeting group in your town or city because this is global. This is the networking group that meets and everybody in the world gets together. So it's a conversation you really can't afford to not be part of. Um, how do you keep up with it? Well, um, there are books like, like the one I've done uh, that, that try to give you a leg up and make it easy to, to get this latest round of new information. There are also blogs and um, lots of really good information out there that are articles in journals about how to use social media that keep track of the latest and greatest and the changes. It's not something that's hard to do and there are ways to make it much less time consuming. But of course, if you just don't wanna bother with doing it or staying abreast of it, then that's when you hire somebody to do it for you. Yeah. But it's, it's a non-issue. You need to be part of the game. You need to be you part of the conversation. Do. Yeah, and, and think of it this way. You know, you may be at a point in your business where you hire somebody to do your payroll or you hire an accountant to do your taxes because it's not something you want to spend the time learning how to do and staying abreast of. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing. 
except that if you do decide to do it, it's a whole lot easier than doing your taxes, I guarantee you. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you're not, you have to learn to love the numbers. Doesn't mean you have to do the numbers. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And really, social media doesn't have to be hard. It's, it's about going out and connecting with people with things that make their life better or that they're interested in or that make them smile or make them laugh. Um, and it doesn't have to be hard. There are ways to make it much less time consuming. But it's just like you allow time and effort for those networking groups you attend in person. It's another kind of networking. Yeah, absolutely. So your book has special chapters for local businesses, speakers, authors, event promoters. How are their social me media needs different? Well, you know, for example, let's talk about local businesses. I've had people say, I'm a local business, I'm a mom and pop, I only have one location, I'm in a little town, why do I need to be on social media? And there's kind of an assumption there that social media talks to the world and I don't sell to the world, so why do I need to be on there? Well, the neighbors down the street from you are on social media too, the people around the block. You know, let's, let's suppose you have a restaurant and it's a one location restaurant in this one town. People can go on social media and find out um, that you've got a band coming Friday night, what your daily specials are, um, anything that you want to post about what's going on, what's new, what's coming up, what's changed. Hey, we're out of Caesar salad. Uh, gee, our drink special is this. Look at that little league team that we sponsored. Aren't they doing great? And it becomes a hub where people can check in and see what's new, what's fresh, what's going on. A lot of times if people are planning a night out, uh, they, they want to know what they're getting in for before they show up at the door. So for that particular situation, yes, you're a local business, but people are going online to get information. And if they can't get information about your location, they'll probably pick some place where they know they're going to get what they want. Now, change that up to a different kind of business. That could be uh, a manufacturing business. That could be a service company. People are going out there to find out what's new, what you're doing, what's interesting, what your thoughts are on industry trends. That's not the kind of stuff you're going to update your website with. But social media makes it very, very easy. And it requires less of you than a blog although a blog can be very valuable too. The other piece with social media is it, it creates a two-way conversation. And that's what we ultimately want with consumers is for them to tell us what they like, what they don't like, how we can do it better, um, how we've served them and, and open that door to, to a really good communication. So for local businesses, that's key. For speakers and event runners, this is another way to get yourself out there, to get your sizzle reel out there, to let people see you in short video clips to connect with you, to say, hey, look at these events that I'm doing, gives people an idea of just what you're doing in the world so that if you're what they need to connect with, they know how to find you. Um, you know, that, that's the kind of information that I talk about in the chapters with the, the social media platforms that make all those things easy to do. And you mentioned blogs. Are they still a hot commodity? Like, because I remember l years ago, I've had speaker friends and authors saying, oh, I'm not going to go touch blogs. They, they don't do anything for you. And, you know, I'd rather just write the random article. What is the traction around blogs? Are the, is there still some traction there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think what we've seen is a lot of websites have transitioned from being the HTML uh, static kind of site that you need to pay somebody a lot of money to update to being a WordPress based site that is essentially a blog and a website all rolled into one. Now the great part about that is when you have something new to announce, when you have a trade show coming up, when you have a speaking engagement, when you've just got new video of, of a product demonstration where you on stage, you can upload that yourself or have somebody do that very easily for a lot less money than your average website refresh. Um, that's one big advantage. The other thing is when you do articles in other magazines, that's a great tactic. Don't stop doing that. That gives you a lot of credibility and a lot of reach, but it's scattered all over the place. When you post on your own blog, 
people who are interested in finding out more about you and understanding your credibility and your expertise, all they have to do is scroll down through your blog to read as much or as little of you as they want, but it's all in one place. It's all there. It can build on itself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's real estate on the internet that you own and that nobody can take down or make disappear without you. So, uh, and again, that two-way commenting, it, it creates another venue for conversation. So we're going to just take a sidetrack for a moment, but thank you for talking about the blogs because I, I still read blogs and I comment mm -hmm. on blogs. So I was just curious, is, am I still part of the game? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So family history is a huge hobby. I know there's Ancestry.com and I'm not doing any sponsorship promotions, but people, this is a great thing that people are doing. And your book has a whole chapter on how social media has changed the game for family historians, as well as academics. What, um, what would, should someone know about finding and sharing family history online? Absolutely. You know, that is just such a huge use on the internet. And let me say that of the, the experts that I've interviewed in the Essential Social Media Marketing Handbook, about half of them are American, half of them are Canadian. So you're getting a really interesting perspective. And in the genealogy chapter, I had um, an American historian and a Canadian professional genealogist. And uh, the, the, the uh, interviews, the conversation was just absolutely fantastic. But, you know, everybody thinks about Ancestry.com. But, and that is a wonderful site. But there, there are several other sites that have grown up in, uh, you know, since Ancestry.com to, to um, augment that. Uh, and governments are doing much better at bringing public records online. Museums are bringing records online. Maps and survey tracts and all kinds of industry information. Um, local, histori local historical associations are bringing information online. And amateur historians, family historians, it's... You know, you can get a scanner now for about a hundred bucks. They're scanning great grandpa's letters from World War I. They're scanning that picture from 1895. They're putting it online. And now, instead of having all this stuff get passed around, maybe at a family reunion or mailed to that cousin you know is interested in it and it goes in a drawer somewhere, nobody else sees it. Now you can create a Facebook group and talk with all your cousins all over the world and pool that information. If you're looking into, you know, a lot of us have lived in towns that were built by an industry. They were a coal town or a railroad town, or uh, they, they were built by an industry. So the history of that industry is also likely to give clues to the, the families and the people who lived in those towns. As those, those special interest historical societies bring that information online. I know, for example, in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, a lot of the little coal towns have started digging into the past on these uh, companies that may have gone out of business in 1910. But as they bring that online and they go, look, here's a picture of the workers who worked in this coal tipple in 1910. Oh my God, there's great grandpa. And they, they come up with the names of the people who were employees at that time. We're now able to see all that information because it's online and social media gives us the chance to be able to talk about it with other people who are just as passionate about it. Because be honest, when you're really into this, you know, sometimes your, your significant other and your family are like, all right, already, you know, I think I've heard everything <laughs> I need to hear about this. You can go online and talk to the other people whose families have heard yeah. about and just, you know, go for it. So there's the social aspect, but there's this wealth of information that we've never been able to get our arms around quite this easily before. And it's just kind of mind blowing. It is. And you know, what? I just want to tap into, you talk about Facebook groups throughout, throughout mm -hmm. our conversation. And are people using Facebook groups to also monetize online as well? Yes. Um, what I'm seeing is, you know, a couple of years ago when people wanted to do a, a mastermind group or they wanted to do a group that was a follow-up, say, to a webinar series, there were some 
good platforms out there like Moodle and, and some others, but you know, they were cumbersome. They were a separate app. You had to get in and learn how to do things. Um, and some of those have gone by the boards. Facebook, everybody's on it. Everybody's fairly good at using it. Um, if you do a closed group, that is only by invitation and you get to accept people or not. And you say, hey, you've just been to my speaking engagement. You've just attended my event. You've just done my online seminar. I uh, want to extend the conversation. You have some more questions. Here's the link to the closed invitation members only Facebook group. Now you can continue to talk to the event leader. You can talk to the other people you met in the event. And it's a private gathering. That can go on indefinitely, extending the value of that class or event or retreat or program. Uh, and it's free. It's free for everybody. You don't have to learn how to use a different kind of software and pay a fee for it and upload it and struggle with it. They don't have to figure out how to log into something new. Everybody's already there. It's just like taking people into a side room at a party to have a private conversation. Mm -hmm. They were already going to be there. So yes, that's been a great way to enhance uh, monetized events. And, um, you know, if you want to charge for the privilege of being part of that closed Facebook group, there's nothing stopping you. Uh, that can certainly be built in as one of the benefits. I know I've done coaching programs with other people who have done that, and I've planned uh, using that myself. So yes, it's it's just makes things so much easier. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to leverage it. That yes. From what you're, and do you have anything specific in the book discussing that portion or is that part of a next book? That's probably part of a next group. I do touch on it. I touch on some of the uses for Facebook groups, but getting into the monetizing piece is probably for, for the next book. Okay. I, so I always know there's a more, more books to come with you. <laughs> oh yeah, always. <laughs> so we, you talked a lot about video changing social media and you talk about and why it's important do people need to be actors now as well as experts you know i i ask that to several of our um video experts in here like michael port because you know for example if you if you've read any of michael's books um you know book solid yeah. steal the stage he's not only a a really great uh business educator but the guy was a former actor and I said okay look this is probably easy for you but what about the rest of us what about somebody who is a good subject matter expert they went to university to learn something they didn't go to drama school um, how do they feel can can they utilize video and the answer I got across the board from Michael from Lou Bortone from a number of, of other video experts is absolutely this is about like know and trust this is about being yourself so you don't feel like you have to be an actor to go to that chamber of commerce meeting, to go to that uh, local networking group. You don't have to be an actor on video either. Depending on the kind of video, depends on how much you dress up, how formal you are, how spiffy it needs to be. If you're gonna do a video that is kind of your branding statement, yeah, that's something you probably wanna hire somebody to help you do. Maybe you're in a suit, maybe you're in a studio, but, the real power with video on social media comes from um, that, that moment of inspiration when you're out at an event or you're doing something and you whip out your phone and you do that Facebook Live and you say, you know, this happened to me and it really struck me that this is a thought that would be useful for people in business and up it goes. And that's the kind of in the moment, gee, I feel like I know you conversation that video can make happen and that's very powerful too so um in fact our, our mutual friend charmaine hammond tells a story in there um she, she does this wonderful um charity tour and it's all about this book that she wrote about her dog toby and she has all these sponsorships and um she was actually walking the dog and stopped to clean up after him and did a a Facebook Live in the moment about how cleaning up after your dog is a lot like cleaning up the mess at work and how other people leave things for other people to clean up. And this is really important that you clean up your own mess. And here's some ways to do it. She said she got phenomenal <laughs> reaction to that video and she did it at the dog park about a subject that, you know, we don't usually talk about. And that 
but it, it fit with her branding, it fit with what she was doing, it fit with dog lovers, and it made a, a great point without being too formal, too heavy handed. So no, just be yourself. Mm -hmm. And the people who are gonna be attracted to you are going to get to feel like they know you. And that's the real key. It gives a new meaning <laughs> to different <laughs> pile, pile of poop. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Same day, different poop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So much wealth of content here, uh, Gail. You've given us so many nuggets um, for us to think about and digest. Um, how can people stay in touch with you? Well, believe it or not, I'm on social media. Uh, <laughs> so you can find my Facebook business page at 30 Day Results Guide, but you can also follow my personal profile at uh, Gail Z. Martin. Um, and I'm on Twitter as Gail Martin PR. You can find my website at dreamspinnercommunications.com. And I'm on LinkedIn as Gail Z. Martin. Look for, for Gail Z. Martin, because it's a common name. There are a lot of others that aren't me. Um, and of course, the books are available online and in bookstores worldwide. Well, and before we let you go, I just want to share a little bit about your fiction world with the world because a lot of our listeners even though they're in business they might have an addiction to books like i do and um but mine are primarily the business world but to share with them some of the other things that you do sure well uh, i write epic fantasy urban fantasy and together with my husband larry and martin steampunk uh, which is kind of the victorian era that never was but should have been I have a brand new epic fantasy series uh, starting in July from Solaris Books, and the first book there is Scourge. So epic fantasy is the uh, sword and sorcery, Game of thrones -y kind of big world, knights, magic, castles kind of thing. That's coming in Scourge, and uh, it's medieval monster hunters, and uh, monsters have masters. So it's, it's a fun series. And uh, I have two other epic fantasy series chronicles the necromancer and ascending kingdom saga the urban fantasy is deadly curiosities a uh, series set in charleston south carolina about getting haunted objects off the market and out of the wrong hands and i mentioned the steampunk iron and blood which is set in a victorian era pittsburgh that is a little different from the one in the history books how cool you are such a multi-talented woman and i <laughs> admire you oh well, thank you well, thank you for coming on the show. What is one piece of advice when it comes to social media right now that you would like to leave our listeners with? Be consistent. You know, if you join a, an in-person networking group, you don't go for a week or a month and say, well, I didn't sell me a million dollars worth of stuff, so I'm not going back there. It doesn't work. You understand that it takes time to build connections and for people to like, know, and trust you. Social media works the same way. Just because you're out there for a week or a month or six months doesn't mean people are at the stage where they need what you do or have gotten to know you well enough. So you have to be consistent and committed to showing up and being there consistently so that when they're ready to buy, they know you well enough to trust you with the purchase. So, so important. Thank you for that. Consistency is key, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Gail, for joining us on the Millionaire Woman Show, talking about thank leadership, you. business, and human potential. Everyone, just if you get a chance, if you take something and you've learned something, you've implemented it, we'd love to hear from you. Either email Gail or go on to my website at www.debrakazowski.com and hold that up again, again Gail. Her book, The Essential Social Media Marketing Handbook, you're going to want to get your hands on that, that new roadmap for maximizing your brand, influence, and credibility. Also, the other thing is we'd love to stay in touch with you. You don't want to miss out. As Gail said, you know, that email marketing is still key. So go to, again to the website at debrakazowski.com. Get on there. You get a free MP3 download to really powerhouse your productivity and performance to help you become more profitable in your biz. As, and the other thing is go over to iTunes, share this episode, get people interacting and talking about the strategies behind the social media platforms. Give us a five star high five and write us a review. We would love to hear from you. As Mahama Gandhi said, be the change you wish to be in the world. So 
see in the world. So go out and do some great things and make today great. Take care, everyone.